The draft order for the 2022 NBA draft is finally set, and the Orlando Magic was awarded with the number one pick for the fourth time in franchise history. The pre-draft process officially started this week, and NBA scouts and executives will have the difficult task of evaluating a lot of prospects, which includes individual interviews, pro days, and team workouts, all the way up to draft night on June 23rd. There might not be a unanimous number one prospect this year, but that doesn't mean you won't find at least three or four franchise changing prospects in this year's draft class. This is my third and final mock draft for the 2022 NBA draft class. It really wasn't a surprise that the Orlando Magic struggled to win consistently this past season. They had two of their best young players coming off major injuries and were definitely not going to be ready for the start of the season. One was able to eventually make his debut, but the other missed the entire season. Markel Fultz was able to come back in late February, but Jonathan Isaac missed his second consecutive season with a knee injury, which makes you question his future with this team. This was a very young team with a lot of talent, but they could never stay healthy. When some guys will come back, there will be another player going out with injuries, which makes it a little difficult to get guys in rhythm playing with each other. Regardless of how many forwards the Magic have right now, they should just get the best talent available. The talent that they feel is worthy of the number one pick. You can sort out the rest later. With the number one pick in the 2022 NBA Draft, the Orlando Magic select Jabari Smith Jr. from Auburn University. He's the youngest of the top three big man prospects, and I believe he's the more complete player. This past college basketball season, Smith proved to be the best shooting big in the draft class, shooting 42% from three-point range. This silky smooth jump shooting forward stands around 6'10 with a 7'2 wingspan. He has a very high release point on his jump shot, and his shooting form reminds a lot of NBA scouts of Kevin Durant. He's very confident in his jump shot, and will pull up with only just an inch of space, and he's capable of knocking them down whether it's heavily contested or not but he can fall in love with his jump shot a little too much, which we did see a lot in this last game in the tournament. He's athletic, has good lateral quickness for a man his size, and can put the ball on the ground and create his own offense. As good as he can be on offense, he has just as much potential on defense. His ability to guard four positions is the versatility that every team is looking for in today's NBA. He can switch on to guards, showing his quickness to contain smaller players, and from time to time has shown the strength to hold his own against bigger players. The Magic is in desperate need of a legit go-to guy on offense, night in and night out. Jabari Smith can be the piece that the Orlando Magic been looking for for a long time. OKC has been collecting draft picks more than any other franchise has in NBA history. But no matter how many first round picks you have, you still need to get lucky in the draft lottery for a chance to get one of the best prospects that year. OKC hasn't had a top three pick since 2009 when they drafted James Harden third overall. And that streak will finally end as they ended up with the second overall pick this year. OKC has been slowly adding talent to their roster and with this pick, they can really start to build something special in Oklahoma City. With the second pick in the draft, the Oklahoma City Thunder select Chet Holmgren from Gonzaga University. This team is solidified for the most part at the guard position with Shea Gilgis-Alexander and Josh Giddy. The addition of Holmgren will be a match made in heaven for OKC. This team will get their big man of the future, a potential all-defensive first teamer to build around. Chet has a rare blend of size, length, and skills, which have made some scouts believe he's the best prospect in this year's draft class. Holmgren has stretch ability and has a lot of talent as a face-up scorer. He can shoot the ball from deep, has good handles, nimble feet, nice post moves, and a soft touch around the rim with both hands. He's as fluid as a wing player in transition, unlike most seven-footers. OKC had a lot of trouble finding consistency at the big man position last season. Chet Holmgren can solve a lot of those problems. The Houston Rockets finished with the worst record for the second consecutive year. While there were plenty of lows during the season, there were some things to feel good about with this young team. They had three rookies that got significant playing time this year in Jalen Green, Alperin and Shane Goon, and Josh Christopher, and the returns were more than exceptional. Jalen Green had a very slow start, 
but turned it around during the last two months of the season. The Rockets had one of the worst defenses in the league, and their biggest struggles were in the paint. With the position that the Rockets are in with the third pick, and with most teams having a three big man at the top, this should be an easy choice for the Rockets. Just pick the big man that is left on the board. With the third pick in the draft, the Houston Rockets select Paolo Bancaro from Duke University. Bancaro is a modern day NBA player with size and skill set to score from all over the court. Physically and mentally, he's ready to compete right now in the NBA. He has great mobility and is very well coordinated, has good handles for his size, and has a nice mid-range game with a smooth release. He can get defenders off balance with his quickness, jab step, and brute strength, and he can finish around them with finesse. Ben Carroll thrives playing through contact and overpowers smaller defenders. While defense is not one of his strengths at the moment, he does have all the tools needed to be at least solid on that end. His physical attributes are elite, and he has an excellent feel for the game. He was able to lead the Blue Devils to the Elite Eight against some great defenses. Paolo showed his full repertoire with some tremendous drives, passes, and shots from all over the court. When the team needed him to get aggressive down the stretch, he showed up. He was in attack mode and made key plays for his team. Son would say he looked like the number one pick in the draft. The Sacramento Kings got off to a rough start, and it didn't necessarily get any better from there. The Kings became the first and only team to make an in-season coaching change in 21-22, as Alvin Gentry took over for Luke Walton. The Kings made a major splash at the trade deadline, which shocked a lot of people around the league when they sent Tyrese Halliburton to Indiana in a six-player deal that landed two-time All-Star Demata Sabonis in Sacramento. Halliburton seemed to be untouchable at the time, just as much as De'Aaron Fox. This move was made for the short term for the most part, as they wanted to help push this team into play in tournament territory during the home stretch of the season. However, the Kings continued to lose games after the trade and ultimately shut down Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox as neither of them played in the final three weeks of the season due to injuries. But Sacramento did break a record this year, but it's definitely not something to be proud of. They have missed the playoffs for the 16th consecutive season. Adding the best talent available is the best course of action for the fourth overall pick. With the fourth pick in the draft, the Sacramento Kings select Shaden Sharp from the University of Kentucky. The biggest mystery in this year's draft is no doubt Shaden Sharp. He committed to Kentucky and was eligible to play midway of the college basketball season, but John Calipari chose not to play him at all this year. Sharp definitely looks the part. He has the prototypical size you need for an NBA two guard. 6'6 with a near seven foot wingspan and unreal athleticism. He creates space with ease off the dribble and around screens. His shot mechanics and handles should allow him to create space for himself on all three levels once he develops more. Sharp is an excellent finisher and can't embarrass you at the rim. After a breakout performance in the EYBL circuit, Sharp ascended to the top of NBA draft boards in just a few short months. The Kings need to make this gamble. They are desperate to turn this around after making so many boneheaded decisions over the last 16 years. We never saw Sharp play against college competition in a more structured system, which can be a huge risk if you want to draft him this high. But I believe the Kings are in perfect position to afford to take this gamble. The Detroit Pistons rebuild took a major step forward when they won the draft lottery in 2021 and gave them the privilege to draft Cade Cunningham, and he did not disappoint. He led all first year players in points per game, and his strong second half of the season reinforced the Pistons' belief in his ability to be a franchise player. Along with Cunningham, the Pistons also have two other nice young pieces in Sadiq Bey and Isaiah Stewart. And with their possible cap space this summer, the Pistons are on the right track. Some will look at the draft lottery as a disappointment for the Pistons, and rightfully so. They were one of three teams that had the best odds to get the number one pick. But with how everything is lined up at the moment, the Pistons could have the opportunity to draft one of the best prospects in the draft, in my opinion. With the fifth pick in the draft, the Detroit Pistons select Jaden Ivey from Purdue University. I believe Ivey has the potential to be the best in this draft class. He has elite speed and burst to get by any defender and has the athleticism to play above the rim. 
There's a reason why a lot of fans of NBA scouts compare him to Ja Morant. There are obvious similarities in the way Ivy and Morant play. Ivy's offense took a huge leap in the sophomore year, as he was able to consistently create space for himself and score on multiple levels. He started the season hot from three-point range shooting around 40%, but he did cool off down the stretch and he finished the season shooting around 34%, but he still found ways to impact the game offensively. Now Ivy wasn't always fully locked in on the defensive side of the ball, especially during conference play, but he did show flashes of being a pesky and relentless defender at times. His defensive effort needs to improve, no doubt about it. His fit with Cade Cunningham seemed to be perfect. A big guard like Kay Cunningham at 6'7 with the ability to be a floor general and run an offense is a perfect match for a 6'4 guard with natural scoring ability like Ivy. Improving as a playmaker is something Ivy needs to work on. But if he's playing alongside Cunningham, his transition to the NBA can be so much smoother. He can focus on what he's naturally good at, and that's putting the ball in the hole, while also learning to be a playmaker along the way. The Indiana Pacers is the one team dropping inside the top 10 that most fans would not have expected at the start of the season. Even though they lost in the play-in tournament in the previous season, the Pacers always seemed like a team that had the experience and talent to make a decent run in the playoffs. A core of Brogdon, Levert, TJ Warren, Miles Turner, and Sabonis looked like a team that could not only make the playoffs, but could realistically compete for home court in the first round. But health was a major issue for the Pacers and that ultimately led to their downfall. The Pacers' identity has always been centered around their defense. This past season, they finished 28th in defensive rating, far and away the worst defensive season in the last decade for the franchise. In fact, it was the first time that the Indiana Pacers finished in the bottom 10 in defensive rating since 1998-99. Malcolm Brogdon and Miles Turner are the team's two best defenders and they only played 36 and 42 games respectively. Finding a prospect who is more known for playing defense will be ideal at this spot. With the sixth pick in the draft, the Indiana Pacers select Keegan Murray from the University of Iowa. Murray is a prime example of a player benefiting from staying in college for one more year versus fast tracking to the NBA draft when you're not ready. This past season, Murray's stock skyrocketed with his production across the board. The nation's fourth leading scorer is the jack of all trades. Murray makes an impact in just every facet of the game. He is a long 3 and D wing who does a good job recognizing mismatch situations and ranked in the 98th percentile in post-ups, averaging 1.3 points per possession. His outside shooting improved tremendously from his freshman year, as he shot 40% from three in his sophomore season. And Murray doesn't always have to have the ball in his hands to be effective. He's a great rebounder, and he's a good cutter. Now, he's not going to blow you away with elite speed, quickness, or athleticism, but his relentless motor probably is his greatest strength. He remained consistent all season and can be a plug-and-play guy right away at the NBA level and give solid rotation minutes. Murray is a versatile defender who shows a lot of good instincts and awareness on that end of the floor. He plays with great positioning and solid fundamentals and has enough mobility to step out and guard in space. And he can also protect the rim as he averaged nearly two blocks per game. The defensive side of the ball is something the Pacers will value from the most from a prospect like Keegan Murray. He might not be a superstar talent, but he can be a key piece to a franchise going forward. The Portland Trailblazers probably had the most disappointing draft lottery of any team. The Blazers have been adamant about continuing to build around Damian Lillard, and they need all the assets they can get to put themselves in the best position to add talent around Dame. Having a top three pick could have certainly been a huge trade chip to possibly add a proven all-star. The Blazers are one of the teams in the lottery that I expect to trade their pick. It really doesn't make sense to move forward by adding a 19-year-old to a team where their best player is 31 years old. I believe Portland will be the most active team before the NBA draft, trying to look for the best deal for their aging star. But for right now, this is who I have them picking, if they end up keeping it. With the seventh pick in the draft, the Portland Trailblazers select A.J. Griffin from Duke University. This guy was a five-star recruit and had a history of injuries in the last couple of years. And add to the fact that he had a knee sprain before the season even started, 
We should have expected him to have a slow start to the season, and that's exactly what happened. But eventually he showed what he can do as he got more healthy and got more time and opportunity. Griffin has a nice first step in silent handles, which helps him create separation on drives and allows him to keep the defense honest. Strong dribble moves allow Griffin to create space both beyond the arc and in the mid-range. I would say he's mostly a straight line driver, but Griffin did show at times that he can create opportunities off the dribble. After joining the starting lineup on January 12th, the 18-year-old wing proved to be one of the most efficient scorers in the nation. He shot extremely well on catch and shoot jumpers. Griffin is a physical freak, built like a tank, standing 6'6", 225 pounds with a near 7-foot wingspan. He's physically ready to compete in the NBA right away. Off the ball, he has shown a strong basketball IQ, moving without the ball and finding open spaces on the perimeter or by filling the lane correctly. He also has good defensive instincts on the ball and off the ball. He has the lateral quickness, wingspan, and strength to guard at least three positions, and he's still only 18 years old. Griffin is one of, if not the best shooter in the draft class, and his combination of improving offensive game, athletic ability, and defensive potential makes him an obvious choice at number seven. On paper, the New Orleans Pelicans should be on track to compete for a top four spot in the Western Conference. There's really not that many teams in the West that has more talent from top to bottom than the Pelicans if they're healthy. But that's the problem. Their former number one overall pick, Zion Williamson, has played less than half his game so far in his short career. When he's on the court, he has put up all-star numbers. But Zion can't help the team win if he's always in street clothes on the bench. The Pelicans traded for CJ McCollum before the trade deadline to pair with their other big time scorer in Brandon Ingram. They have found gems in players like Herbert Jones and Jose Alvarado. It seems like the only position of need for the Pelicans is a starting point guard. There is one player in particular that has been rising up on draft boards that could catch the Pelicans eye. With the eighth pick in the draft, the New Orleans Pelicans select Dyson Daniels from the G League Ignite. Daniels is a combo guard with excellent size standing 6'7 with a 6'11 wingspan. His size and skill set reminds me of a young Sean Livingston. He is very fundamentally sound on both ends of the court. He's a natural facilitator. He plays with his head up and is quick to set up transition opportunities once he secures a rebound. In the half court, Daniels is patient and takes what the defense gives him. From pick and roll sets to operating out of the high post, Daniels is constantly searching to get his teammates high percentage looks. He possesses good body control, balance, and power to finish through contact. He's effective as a downhill driver with the ability to size up a defender and attack. He has an excellent right-handed floater and can finish at the rim comfortably with his left and right hand. If a team attempts to put a smaller player on him, Daniels has a collection of post moves that he can utilize. He might not have an elite first step or is crazy athletic, but he has the size and basketball IQ to be able to still be effective on the court. His jump shot is still a work in progress. Even though his three-point percentage did increase significantly in the final nine games, he still was an overall 25% three-point shooter. But the sample size for his free throw and three-point attempts are just too low to really project future improvement. Daniels show excellent defensive instincts on the ball and off the ball. Like I said earlier, he has great fundamentals, good defensive awareness, and good footwork to shut down players in one-on-one -on -one situations. Daniels has the skill set and size to give the Pelicans the starting point guard they have been looking for. For the first time in decades, the San Antonio Spurs' main focus was developing their young talent. Greg Popovich was pretty clear about development being their goal and said that tanking was not an option. The Spurs bounced back from a horrendous start to the season and played their hearts out every single night and had a chance to secure a spot in the playoffs by competing in the play-in tournament. While the Spurs ultimately missed the playoffs for the third straight season, they made a lot of progress in their first year of a full rebuild. Guard is not necessarily a position of need for the Spurs but there's still a great talent available at this spot. With the ninth pick in the draft, 
the San Antonio Spurs select Johnny Davis from the University of Wisconsin. If someone had told me in January that Johnny Davis would have been picked outside the top five, I would have probably laughed in their faces. But after bad shooting percentages down the stretch and other prospects emerging, Johnny Davis finds himself projected around the 10th pick. I still have a lot of confidence in him as a prospect. Davis can get buckets in his sleep, and he ain't afraid to let you know about it. He is a fiery competitor and shows a lot of emotion when he's out there on the court. He has a crafty handle and an underrated burst, but he doesn't always need a screen to score. He can get his own off the dribble. He has a nice first step and is a great finisher around the basket. And if you can stop him from getting to the lane, he can hit you with a step back fadeaway jumper. Davis was one of the best tough shot makers in college basketball, and he showed up in big games. He's an elite defender in both on the ball and off the ball situations. He fights hard through screens effectively when chasing assignments off the ball. Davis has proven he can work through multiple actions to force a contested shot. Even if he gets beat, his length and footwork allows him to recover quickly. Him and DeJounte Murray could wreak havoc in the backcourt on the defensive end. The Spurs still need a natural scoring threat, somebody who can take the pressure off Murray, who can do a little bit of everything. The Spurs is the perfect organization for Davis to refine his skills and become the best version of himself. The Washington Wizards are currently stuck in no man's land. Good enough to somewhat compete for the last playoff spot, but not bad enough to actually get a top three pick in the draft. The Wizards were still a bad defensive team, and they were actually a worse defensive team this year compared to last year. The hiring of a defensive-minded head coach in West Onsell Jr. didn't make that much of a difference. The season went fully off the rails in early February when Bradley Bill opted to have season-ending surgery to repair a torn ligament in his left wrist. And everybody knows by now he can't opt out of the final year of his contract and become a free agent this summer. Trading for Kristaps Porzingis was actually a sneaky good move for the Wizards and could be instrumental in keeping Bill in Washington. Point guard is a definite position of need, but there isn't a point guard worthy of being drafted at this spot in my opinion. With the 10th pick in the draft, the Washington Wizards select Benedict Matherin from the University of Arizona. The Canadian is one of the best athletes in this draft class, and he has a pure shooting stroke. The 6'6 guard became more assertive in his sophomore year. He rose to the occasion in the biggest games of the season, scoring 25 against Wichita State, 30 against Illinois, and 28 against Tennessee. Going into his sophomore season, we knew that Matherin had the size and spot-up ability to be a good guard on the next level. He has continued his excellent shooting this season, even though he wasn't as efficient from three this season compared to his freshman year. He still shot around 37%. Matherin has a nice high release on his jump shot, and he gets good lift on it as well. It's a picture-perfect stroke, and it's nearly impossible for defenders to get their hands on it. But he has expanded his game more on the offensive end. The biggest improvement is his ability to attack defenses off the bounce. He's more of a threat on the ball and off the ball. Whether Bradley Beal resigns or not, the addition of another two-guard would be a good move for the Wizards. The New York Knicks brought back nine of their top 12 players from last year's team as they were trying to make consecutive playoff appearances for the first time in nearly a decade. But the new additions didn't make the impact that many expected them to, and with the absence of their key piece Derrick Rose and Eastern Conference getting better as a whole, it really wasn't a surprise why the Knicks had a bad season. Julius Randle couldn't duplicate the production and efficiency that he had last season, which has people questioning. Was the 2021 season for Randall a fluke? He also had somewhat of an unhealthy relationship with Knicks fans throughout the season, and it seems like he wants to be on the first flight out of New York City. The only bright spot for the Knicks was the play of their young guy, R.J. Barrett. He is the only player in Knicks history to average at least 20 points per game at the age of 21 or younger. The Knicks would love to draft the point guard at this spot. But there is a talented big man prospect that could be available at this spot. With the 11th pick in the draft, the New York Knicks select Jalen Duran from the University of Memphis. His physical gifts and his age are huge selling points as a prospect, 
He is one of the youngest prospects in the draft. While he's a tad short for the center position at 6'10", his 7'5 wingspan and strong frame is more than enough to make up for it. He plays with impressive power on both ends of the court, despite being so young. He showed the ability to get vertical and absorb contact at the rim defensively, and his steady improvement throughout the season was very encouraging. Most NBA scouts already knew he was very raw offensively, and at this point, anything that Durant can give you offensively at this point is a bonus. He only attempted one three-pointer during the whole season. Why commit long-term to Mitchell Robinson? A guy who really hasn't showed that much improvement since his rookie year. Durant is a Durant is a much better choice long term for the Knicks. He has way more upside as an overall player. With the 12th pick in the draft, the Oklahoma City Thunder select Mark Williams from Duke University. With just two picks, OKC can solve their big man issues that plagued them last season. Holmgren and Williams could be OKC's version of the Twin Towers. Williams' size and physicality can be a nice compliment next to Holmgren, who will have trouble guarding NBA centers initially. Williams had very impressive measurements at the NBA Combine. He came in standing 7'2 with a 7'6 wingspan. With his quick leaping ability and speed, Williams covers a lot of ground on defense. He could develop into a menace on defense in the NBA. He was one of the most productive players on defense in college basketball. Before this season, only four players had a defensive rebound percentage above 20%, a block percentage above 10%, and overall box plus minus above 11.5. Add Williams to that list. 78% of his offense came at the rim, including 96 dunks, which led the nation. Much of his offensive game came on putbacks, dunks, and alley-hoop passes but he did show a little flash with his back to the basket game from time to time. For the second consecutive season, the Charlotte Hornets season ended in a blowout loss in the play-in tournament, this time to the Atlanta Hawks. But they have increased their win total by 10 games in the last two seasons. But after failing to make the playoffs once again, it's hard not to look at this season as a disappointment. The one thing that wasn't a problem was their offense. The Hornets ranked fourth in points per game and fifth in pace. With Miles Bridges' breakout year and the franchise player LaMelo Ball improving game by game, their offense looked like one of the best in the league at times. But it was the other side of the ball that was the problem. Charlotte ranked in the bottom 10 in points allowed, field goal percentage allowed, three point percentage allowed, and opponents assist per game. That's a recipe for disaster no matter how efficient the offense is. Adding defensive help at this spot could be the Hornets' motivation with this pick. With the 13th pick in the draft, the Charlotte Hornets select Jeremy Sohan from Baylor University. Sohan's play style is infectious and relentless. This guy ranked outside the top 100 nationally and was not looked at as a one and done prospect. That changed in the back half of the college basketball season as he emerged as a well-rounded player. His NBA stock is tied to his skills on the defensive end of the court, no doubt about it. Due to his size, awareness, and athleticism, Sohan can guard all three front court positions. His lateral quickness and footwork allow him to stay in front of perimeter players. He rarely misses a rotation, and he forces opponents to throw up tough shots or reset offensively. When Sohan is not on the ball, he's an active and engaged help defender. He's always on the move, and it seems to always be in the right position. On offense, he's a low usage type of player. He has been developing his offensive game with quick drives to the basket, utilizing a spin move with a soft touch around the basket. Sohan has an excellent feel for operating out of the dunker spot. His good cuts to the lane often led to highlight worthy finishes at the rim. His outside shooting is definitely one of his weaknesses at the moment. He only shot 30% from three point range. As a passer, Sohan showed the ability to make simple reads as well as some impressive outlet passes after a rebound. He is also experiencing international competition. He played a season in Germany's third tier professional league just before he thrived in the Big 12 as a freshman this past season. The Cleveland Cavaliers exceeded any and all expectations this past season. In the era where NBA teams want to downsize and increase the space on the court, J.B. Bickerstaff decided to zig when the rest of the league was zagging. 
Starting two seven footers in today's NBA is not that uncommon. Starting three is unprecedented. The front court of Evan Mobley and Jared Allen made life a living hell for opposing teams on the defensive end. Lowry marketed and Kevin Love provided outside shooting, and Darius Garland developed into one of the best young guards in the league and was named an All Star for the first time, along with Jared Allen. At one point, the Cleveland Cavaliers were at the top of the Eastern Conference, looking like they were going to make the playoffs for the first time since LeBron James left in 2018. But injuries took away a lot of the momentum they had gained from the beginning of the season and ultimately lost twice in the play-in tournament and once again missed the playoffs. This team is just scratching the surface of what they could eventually become. With their front court set for the most part, drafting a guard could be the move for the Cavaliers at this spot. With the 14th pick in the draft, the Cleveland Cavaliers select Malachi Brenner from Ohio State University. Brandon was ESPN's 34th ranked player in the class of 2021. And early in the season, you would have never predicted that this guy would be a one and done prospect. He didn't have his first double digit scoring game until December 5th. Two games later, he had his best game of the season, dropping 35 points against Nebraska. From that point on, NBA scouts started taking notice of the Buckeyes freshman. Offensive efficiency is the word I would use to describe Brandon's game. He shot nearly 50% from the field and 42 from three. He's a savvy three-level scorer who finds different ways to get buckets. He can knock down contested shots with ease and is willing to pull the trigger with just an inch of space. And he also flashed the ability to score off the dribble. Those attempts typically came in pick and roll situations, an area he excels in. When Brenham attacks the rim, he has strong shoulders that allow him to take contact while finishing at the rim. Tightening up his handles will help him create even more separation on defenders. He has the competitive drive and edge, along with his size, to be a plus defender on the next level. But like with a lot of guards coming into the NBA, it could take some time to get adjusted. 